Hello and welcome to this building room session. Um, this is a building room, building smart session as part of the Building Smart International Standards Summit here in sunny Rome 2023. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have people in the room physically in Rome and we also have people joining us through the Hopping platform online. My name is John Proctor uh, and I will be your moderator today. Uh, this session is scheduled to last for 90 minutes. It is an update on some of the projects that are taking place within the building room. Uh, it's going to be introduced and hosted by Merbek Bekboliev, the technical lead for the building room, and I will pass to him very shortly. Uh, before I hand over to Merbek, I'd like to remind you that this is a hybrid event. If you're online, um, your microphones will remain muted for the duration of the session. So if you wish to ask a question, please do so in the comments box. Uh, I'll prompt you through the hopping platform shortly. For everyone who's in the room, we have a roving mic. So uh, please do raise your hand and we'll give you the mic so everyone can hear you both here and again online. Um, I also need to bring to your attention the information that's on the screen now, that Building Smart is committed to ensuring that participation in the development of standards is unrestricted and the process for their adoption is transparent, and that standards that are developed do not favor any particular provider, but are open, non-binding, and accessible to all. Okay, please take note of our antitrust code of conduct. Uh, I'm gonna pass to Merbeck, who's just gonna say a few words of introduction before we go to Peter and Asim. Good morning, everybody. Good day, good, uh, good evening for all online participants. Really great to, to see many faces here today. And um, I would like to introduce your agenda for today. And uh, the current projects within the building room, we have uh, finishing, like completing projects, projects that have a status quo, that, and all that works will be in accordance with a BSI process. That's important. I would like to introduce the first uh, project that will be in a row as a fire safety and occupant movement analysis and update so will be done by Peter Thompson and Asim Siddiq. We'll, uh, that will be followed with uh, steel construction updates like status quo uh, on the current uh, situation and what uh, will be expected. Next steps will be done by us, uh, Luke Faulkner and me uh, will give uh, and of course our colleagues and uh, supporters, uh, all who are also joining us online today. We will, that will be followed with uh, quantity takeoff IDS uh, through um, Jan Kalso. He is also here. Thank you for joining us today. We will have, that will be exactly an first implementation, I would say, one of the first implementation for IDS that was transformed from MVD to be IDS. That was a really quick step. So more details will come through. Uh, well, yeah, um, Jan. Okay. Then we will have a really detailed technical report that was submitted to uh, to the building room to be, let's say, given through PSI process to the further committees, and then there'll be final voting. So the more details will be given uh, through the members of the working group leaders. And uh, it will be presented uh, um, by uh, Yoshinobu Adachi, da uh, David uh, Vendral, and uh, Sergei Muvic, who they will present its uh, outstanding work regarding the use of IFC spatial zone. It's really useful uh, entity and that it should be implemented by all one software vendors. That's the message. And they will give you more insights later on. So, and of course, we'll have a discussion, Q&A session afterwards. So if you have any, like John already mentioned, if you have any questions, you can also use Hopin for communication, giving your questions, so comments as well, feedback, we're all welcome. So we'll start now with the first session, fire safety and equipment analysis. I'm Peter Thompson and Asim, how are you? Stay there. Thanks, Mubek. Um, yeah, I've just um, invited uh, Pete and Asim to join us. 
people online can uh, can see them. I'm just going to switch to showing your slides, um, and I'll hand over to you to do the presentation. So if you can, yeah, great. Thanks, John. So this today's um, talk is a relatively quick one, um, basically a progress update on both fire safety engineering and occupant movement analysis projects, um, presenting both uh, our Asim Siddiqui from the Fire Safety Engineering Group in the University of Greenwich, and also myself at Movement Strategies, part of GHD, um, and also uh, um, adjunct at Lund University. Next please, John. So the fire safety engineering project um, really covers, a quick recap, covers the data needs for you know, the, the design processes in fire safety engineering analysis, fire growth, material and structural degradation, smoke and heat propagation, um, the protection of the building against fire um, spread and the suppression systems, and general approaches to risk assessment and the strategies to mitigate those. Ultimately, one of the main metrics there is looking at generating what we call an available safe egress time, essentially the time to which a space finally becomes untenable. Uh, next clip, please, John. Uh, and the other sort of sibling project is the occupant movement analysis side, which covers the data needs for um, occupant movement analysis, simulation design, ingress, egress, uh, aspects of circulation, the strategies to optimize efficiencies, different aspects of signage, and ultimately, as a field, they come together to look at evacuation as well um, and the required safe egress time. So um, uh, just one click, please, John. So the required safe egress time is how long it takes to get out of the building and the available safe egress time is when it becomes unsafe. And you obviously want to make sure, um, one more click, please. You obviously want to make sure that the required safe egress time is um, uh, less than the available safe egress time. Uh, next, please, John. So uh, it's important to remember where these projects sit within the overall scheme of things. Within the building room, uh, originally the fire safety engineering project started as one project. And as a group, we decided to split it into two because of the scope involved in covering both areas of fire safety engineering, as well as occupant movement analysis. Um, so they're now split as two separate projects. Occupant movement analysis started First, because the Technical University of Munich um, got some funding to start that project up earlier. So that's underway already and quite mature. Um, and the Fire Safety Engineering Project is about to start soon. Um, and uh, a click please, John. The, on the side, the Regulatory Information Requirements Project. Uh, one more click please. The Regulatory Inf Information Requirements Project um, is obviously directly overlapping because we have to generate analyses which comply with codes, especially on the fire safety engineering side. So those three areas all overlap and complement each other in different ways. Uh, next. The group as an overall working group and advisory group um, has stayed the same for the last six, seven months. Um, so much the same as last time we presented, a very diverse set of people spread across the globe mostly European, but also now covering um, Australia, uh, New Zealand as well. Um, so a good, a good set of people in different areas, different design fields, simulation design, etc. Next, please. Uh, in terms of the current status, we had a call for sponsorship at the BSI Summit about 12 months ago um, for the fire safety engineering side. Uh, that call was met and uh, OFR Fire and risk consultants are uh, kindly uh, contributing from the industrial side and making up a large part of the funding. Uh, University of Greenwich have matched that um, and also Building Smart International, um, thankfully, have gave us some money to, to um, get the project going at the start as well. So all three um, great uh, projects funded now. Uh, and the PhD application um, call was opened a little while ago, that closed. Um, March the 15th, we've got candidate applications under review, and it's intended that a PhD candidate starts in a couple of months' time and gets the project underway, um, uh, and yeah, that's, so going fairly soon. Uh, and that work in terms of the standard size will um, 
integrate and coordinate with uh, my work when I moved to the University of Canterbury, which is to further expand uh, BIM added, which will incrementally um, implement these standards as, as they're developed uh, as well. Okay, next please. And at this point, I'm gonna hand over to Asim uh, uh, to cover the occupant movement analysis side. Uh, thanks, Pete. Uh, so um, as far as uh, occupant movement analysis is concerned, um, we, we have a small team, uh, but they are from different countries. Uh, and as you can see, uh, we have a very good mix. Um, we had our core team, um, the University of Greenwich, um, Accurate and ISC, and then we have people who joined recently. Some joined last year, like Roland from UCrowds, and recently uh, Fred from Bentley. So we have a, a very good uh, team, and uh, we're making good progress. Next slide, please. So it's a two-year project. Uh, in the first first phase of this project, we produced. Uh, process maps, uh, one for circulation analysis, a generic uh, process map, and two for evacuation. Uh, one using UK reverse stages and the other one a uh, generic one. And uh, in this phase, we're focusing on the ex exchange requirements more and we have produced uh, uh, a list of data properties supported by uh, multiple modeling tools. Uh, and we have shared uh, at least with the expert panel, and we're going to organize and uh, uh, an expert panel meeting uh, in April. Uh, one more click, John. Uh, one more, please. So we also um, uh, written an industry inside report related to this project, uh, which was published recently. Uh, and we covered uh, key aspects of this uh, project in that report. Uh, one more click, John. So the expert panel is, uh, as I said, is going to be in, in April, probably in uh, third week. Uh, we have proposed a date and just waiting for confirmation from the expert panel members. And we have already received some feedback. Uh, and we're also planning to present um, the key aspects of this work in a, a conference, PET conference, uh, 2023 in June. Next slide, please. So um, as far as uh, data properties uh, are concerned, uh, there are uh, here are some examples. So for example, if you look at stairs, uh, lift elevators and travelators, we have produced a list of properties. Only some of them are shown here. Uh, and they are supported by several tools. For example, build, uh, building exodus, pathfinder, crowded, uh, steps, uh, same crowds, uh, legion, evacuations, and we are planning to include two more tools, mass motion and uh, Aziri. Next slide, please. Uh, so we have, uh, um, as I said before, we have uh, written an industry inside report, which is available uh, online, so you can have a look. Uh, the QR codes are here. And the uh, we uh, we our abstract for a paper for a PET conference was accepted, and we're planning to present do a presentation in June around the end of June, and hopefully is going to be published in a journal as well. Next slide, please. So this is just an overview, quick overview of the project deliverables and timelines of both projects: fire safety engineering and the occupant movement analysis, um, and. Uh, to complement this work and and uh, add-in was developed at the University of Moon um, and Pete was involved in that work uh, by an M uh, it was developed by MSc student and we're going to continue to develop that and for the fire safety we are hoping to have a PhD student in place who's going to work on this uh, project next slide please So in summary, uh, we, the plan is to uh, finish work on this MVD uh, document movement analysis project, uh, hopefully at the end of June. And uh, 
we're going to start work on the fire safety engineering project uh, as soon as possible sometime this year. And uh, the work on the add-in will continue as well in parallel. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, that's, that's basically our uh, short presentation. Uh, thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, uh, please ask. Thanks. Thank you, Asim. Thank you, Pete. Um, excellent presentation, as always. Um, do we have any questions uh, from the room for, for Pete and Asim while we have them? Online from the UK, I believe. Going somewhat smoother than online from the Australia went in an earlier session, but that's another story. Um, no questions at this time? Okay. Um, please do stay with us, Asim and Pete, um, if you have time and wish to see the other presentations. Um, for now, I'll take you out of the stream. Um, and if any questions come in, we'll, we'll ask you at the end. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks very much. Bye. So, yeah. So now? Okay. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> it's a little bit trying to, um, I will take over without moderation directly. I will introduce you. Luke Faulkner. Is it on? One, two? Yeah. Yes, now it's on. So, um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce you Luke Faulkner, who is the leader of the working group and uh, I'm technical advisor, let's say. We're helping uh, this working group to bring a uh, project forward in accordance with BSI uh, process. And uh, today we will uh, give you some updates, short updates. Hi. Uh, I'm Luke Faulkner with the American Institute of Steel Construction. Uh, I am Director of Technology Integration, and uh, that means I kind of oversee anywhere that technology and the structural steel supply chain in the U.S. intersect a little bit. So um, a little background on this project while we're, uh, while we're getting organized here. Probably about, what was that, 10 years ago? Maybe more. Uh, we recognized that we had a problem in the U.S., which was and it's, it's spread now, we have a drastic labor shortage and we are going to see more and more automation and require more and more automation uh, in the structural steel supply chain. Uh, to be able to facilitate that, uh, robotic assembly, robotic welding, uh, we are going to need to present a, an option to simplify communications uh, between management software um, MRP software uh, and the machinery that was going to automate structural steel fabrication. So um, again, going back 10 years or so, what we recognized was IFC was probably going to be a really good solution to this. We had a lot of different file types that our, um, our membership was managing, KISS files, CIS2 files, CNC files, some IFC files. Uh, but we were going to have to really simplify this in order to, um, in order to make our membership successful in automating structural steel fabrication. So uh, we endeavored to take the um, to take an IFC file type and extend it to uh, be able to communicate fabrication level steel information. Uh, this was, gosh, I want to say what 2011 maybe. Uh, at that point, we were only really able to look at um, kind of geometry, coordination level views for structural steel. So um, our technology group started to work with uh, the late Chuck Eastman at Georgia Tech. And what we set out to do was develop an IDM and MVD for structural steel, uh, mostly you know, aimed at the US market. But we wanted to, um, in the interest of scalability, we started with an MVD that we thought would cover the easiest or kind of first 80% of structural steel fabrication. Uh, we figured that was a product that was deliverable and that was a goal that we could meet. Uh, and I think we, we did that or came pretty close to that in the, you know, in kind of the MVD that we did, but we did that um, on an island a little bit. So honestly, the last, gosh, what would you say, six years, seven years? <laughs> uh, you know, my effort, my goal has been to kind of re- um, is to reconnect with the international world of uh, building smart and look at how we can start to extend this and complete the work that we've done. 
um, go through the BSI process, which we, you know, frankly, kind of went around the first time. Um, you know, what, what that means is that we're going to have a goal that would set out to recover the last 20, 25 percent of structural steel fabrication level information that we can do um, and engage with partners uh, from BSI and across the world a little bit. Do you want to add anything? Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. okay, I'm uh, Mirovek Kukuliev. I'm a technical project manager of Bilisma Germany. I'm supporting this uh, um, working group, let's say, on behalf also from uh, Building Room as the advisor. Um, from my background, I also dealt with uh, steel construction in the past in my, when I was dealing with uh, prefabrication. So there you definitely have... Uh, Steel, steel construction as a main, uh, most of the time as a main uh, structures that uh, formula that you can bring together and uh, assemble them on site. So manufacturing will, for DFM, especially DFMA, and that was a point uh, how we had the chance to bring my knowledge at least and support and bring them together into a BIM world, let's say. But uh, like uh, Luke already mentioned, we. We don't have to start from scratch. There is already MVD. There is, there is already I, I, there is also uh, IDM and uh, process maps. And you can see the first, uh, like uh, he mentioned, uh, like Luke mentioned, we have to conform with BSI process. So we did our, uh, we applied with our activity proposal with what was supported with many software uh, vendors, also with uh, domain experts. Well, this is important. Machinery, they all were willing to update their, um, their let's say, capabilities so that they, they, it will, will cop up with current developments, especially taking into account that your new developments in uh, software that now all deliver IFC4. So you, you have to uh, cope up with that. You, keep, you have to keep the pace. So that was a main, I guess, a dri a driven force to bring for, forward this action. And uh, since uh, our application, we, uh, we tried to bring many stakeholders in, the, in it. And uh, of course, chapters uh, is one of the two chapters, let's say, Building Smart Germany. We uh, have a working group and we have a joint working group, not just a working group, but a joint working group together with Bauform Stahl. They have uh, all the steel uh, experts, steel construction experts, they're all uh, there in that joint working group bringing their knowledge, machinery, and of course, software vendors also supporting this activity. And uh, from, uh, from uh, ISC, American Institute of Steel Construction, uh, also actively involved in that activities. And recently we started, uh, let's say, a series, a series of uh, monthly calls to discuss and uh, to uh, take our action, to bring our activity proposal later on. I will explain why, and I can give you now, uh, we can keep that for next slide, right? I will go why we were doing this now. Um, yeah, the, the, the point was we, uh, you could, we, we've illustrated this with a robotic assembly arm, but we're seeing, um, we're seeing more and more robotic assembly and we're, we need a more complete MVD. I guess that's what, yeah, that's I mean, exactly. that's, that's, <laughs> that's what all that was. <laughs> and of course, that, that's a, now this is a tricky point that we, we discussed how you will bring that. Because previously, the previous MVD was a two, implemented in 2012, and it was, of course, based in IFC 2X3. So, uh, of course, you need to cap off with IFC 4. So, we, what we're going to do? We, that what we propose that we will use a basic uh, basis MVD current the current one I have seen four reference view but there's a, a point where something is lacking there in that MVD uh, so that's of course schema is really extended uh, we have many things that already uh, in IFC 4, so that could be profitable to, to the industry. So we can simply, not to reinvent, it, we'll simply bring that additional uh, types and ad additional properties that, of course, also for, through BSDD, but we need some specifics that not available uh, in, uh, or for industry. And the industry are willing to implement that. We have support, direct support from software vendors, from machinery. They 
already starting uh, to started implementing this. This is a demo uh, or let's say tr first trials. How uh, it was uh, sought to bring the stuff into the action, plus the manufacturing uh, was the first trials of manufacturing already successful. The second thing in steel construction is always you will also confirm that uh, you need also plan uh, the drawings for uh, for your steel um, like a welder. They should know where you have to make this uh, openings, right? They, where you have to, to drill it or they have to uh, cut. Uh, and that also could should be able to be uh, in, within the model. And there is an IFC annotation that was proposed to bring it to back into the IFC uh, reference view. That's uh, the one only one example that we currently... Uh, yeah, so there, mo there will be more because we are currently working on detailed uh, project proposal and... Uh, now I think uh, we can yeah, we can see that all these steps you explain this is <laughs> thank you <laughs> we can use that oh, yeah, guy and make it easy idea. yeah so this um, you know believe it or not this is a really simplified view uh, and and a lot of people in the, <laughs> when I do this presentation refuse to believe that uh, this is a business process model notation roughly kind of roughly demonstrating the structural steel, you know, the, the supply or the design process um, from start to finish. It is, I say simplified because we could have come up with, you know, 20 different delivery methods or combination of delivery methods, but by and far, this is what happens. And these are the exchanges that happen almost every time from, you know, what you'd call EM1 all the way to EM11. Um, EM11 being what we call the final steel detailing model view, or what is being fabricated. Uh, so we chose to focus on EM11 for our industry. Obviously there's, you know, you can make arguments for why any single one of these is really valuable, but uh, you know, again, it comes back to which one needs some more information for us to be able to really leverage that. And that was EM11. Um, a secondary note, we also identified EM7, the, uh, the structural model contract or, you know, the engineering to detailing view as well. But that was, uh, that was kind of done uh, as a side project with Georgia Tech. So this is, this is really indicative of a, uh, what, what is, <laughs> believe it or not, a, a fairly straightforward workflow. <laughs> so now I'll come to the next point that we have to cope up again with the current uh, new standards and new developments. So we have now BS, uh, BCF, we have BSTD, of course, this uh, this project, uh, this uh, process map, BPMM process map, should be up updated, of course, accordingly. We need to think about this uh, issue management, how uh, this uh, could bring more, uh, let's say, uh, better iterations between the planner and, uh, um, let's say, uh, manufacturer, so that there will be some uh, steps will be skipped so that you don't need to send a model for something that you can simply clear within the BC app. So that might be an interesting point. That's many things. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I should have added to that to that point. You see, you know, you you kind of see what's circled on there to indicate these models. There's all sorts of, you know, the if you see yellow on there, that kind of indicates a document or like a 2D exchange. So there's a lot of room here to kind of either simplify or sometimes complicate. Yeah. an exchange, but we need to update it regardless. So the first step with, uh, we tried was within, within that joint working group uh, uh, to optimize one little part, like, let's say the partial uh, process map that was uh, mainly focusing on the exchange between architect and still, uh, still uh, contractors. Like they, they, they simply had to get a normal uh, model that I've seen models that they will be able to use further. And uh, of course, that was a tricky part, but they, we did first uh, attempts. So now we, we can explain why we need that. And uh, first of all, we have to agree. We have to find consensus. What is expected? Uh, who will take over? We have uh, many vendors that currently, let's say, implemented uh, the old version of the uh, some softwares, I will not mention any software because they are using this old MVD. And of course, they have an interest to update it. They, they, they are committed to do so. And now it's a point that, of course, we, we need to comply with BSI process, with the regulations. And uh, uh, 
we will do this way that uh, we will uh, add, add on top an IDS as a validation uh, to uh, validation method. Like, uh, of course, this uh, will enable many users uh, to validate your model before it will be sent to. Uh, Manufacturer, manufacturer, yes, yeah. exactly. So this, of course, like, but this is only for validation. It's not for exchange. For exchange, we definitely need MVD because without that, we will not be able to simply export anything. Yeah. So and uh, yeah, that's what we're currently doing. And of course, this is now your turn to call me. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we are. Um, our our current status is we've uh, we've started to assemble our expert panel. In short. Yeah, so we've um, it, we've kind of called on experts from both uh, software um, implementers, use, end users. Uh, we have people from you know various parts uh, of the chain as far as end users go. So we have you know fabricators, uh, structural steel detailers, structural engineers, uh, machinery manufacturers. We're trying to really capture everyone involved in that. Uh, as Mirbeck mentioned earlier. We have um, we're doing monthly calls uh, to start you know, to to really start the progress on this and make sure that we are successfully capturing all aspects of what we need to do to include this in the you know in the MVD and eventually IDS. I think you can slip on it there. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. this is uh, exactly that. Of course, our target is is yellow thing. I mean yellow that we will deliver standard. But of Thank course, you. the first now. We, as you can see, the workflow, we have an activity proposal. Then we will work on, as you can see there, as uh, the a next step, as will be a uh, detailed project plan. And then we are, as soon as it will be, let's say, approved, uh, hopefully it will be approved so we can work yeah. further. Otherwise, we'll, of course, industry needs that. That's a message. That industry uh, is a... Uh, Keen to implement it, and the software vendors are already committed. So we, I, I we think we're refining it yeah. at this. I think, yeah. yeah, we're in kind of the refinement phase right now. I would yeah. say. Okay. Any questions? Thanks, Luke. Thanks, Merbeck. Um, any questions on the steel construction project for the gentleman? If you have any questions online, then please do raise them in the comments section as well. I should add one thing that we forgot. We, yeah, we, sure. we are still very open in our call for participation. Yeah. So if if, uh, if the mood strikes you or if you have an expert that we have somehow overlooked, uh, we are keeping we are we are keeping that pretty open at this point. Absolutely. Yeah. And we have uh, thank you for reminding that we have a monthly calls. So you will get uh, directly um, this calendar events invited. So you just uh, forward that invitation to your experts and domain experts. And of course, if you have you know, so software vendors that are currently implementing or planning to do so, so feel free to forward it. Yeah. Feel free to send our contacts and uh, feel free to join us. So It's not a secret club. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So um, just maybe one question from me, um, something we've been talking about online, Merbeck. Um, so steel construction exists from some time ago as an MVD and you're updating it and bringing it up to the 21st century, which is great. Um, we, we've also, uh, I know you've had that discussion with Leon and others about um, producing an IDS. Have you, have you got that kind of straight or do you, do, you, do you still need some help and assistance from the, the technical team on, you know, IDS versus MVD or? Yes and no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How was that for hedging? Yeah, um, yeah I think uh, we, we've already discussed this a little bit. I think IDS is certainly... Yeah, I think we've certainly determined that needs to be in the scope and that needs to be in the plan. Um, I, I I think our view right now is the shortest path is finishing MVD and making sure IDS is accommodated as well. Yep, I think I that that sounds sensible. I guess it's the sort of thing you can set out in the detailed project plan right, as well. Yeah, isn't so the actual steps that you're going to follow and which documentation comes first and which comes later and so on. Right. Yeah. And which is, yeah, that's, I think that's reasonable. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Luke. Thanks, Merbeck. Great. We're going we're gonna to move on. Um, I'm going to invite Jan to come and join us. Um, it's going to take us through quantity takeoff uh, IDS, I see, um, name of the project. Yeah, please introduce. I think I already did, I already did uh, I mentioned this work. It has, uh, it, it, first of all, it's a K 
candidate standard, as well as remember. It was a candidate standard, and uh, um, Jan already delivered MVD in the past, and that uh, recently it was exactly converted into IDS without any lately, uh, without any problems. So that's of course is an interesting uh, case when you when you have your existing uh, models, existing uh, development to deliver and to convert whatever it's there. Now it's available. So thank you. Uh, Jan, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's been um, a project for several years, uh, and uh, things has um, developed. Uh, so um, for 2x3, uh, there was a, um, and also for 1.5 or something like that, there was a, a, a an MVD for a quantity uh, takeoff. And... Um, uh, there was never software uh, certified according to that. Uh, so the idea was to, to make an uh, MBD uh, to, um, to make it possible to, to certify software. Then um, 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 so that was the basic uh, and that it should be updated. Then there has been uh, uh, ideas of how, which rules should be for, for uh, the 4.0 series and uh, there's been the yeah, kind of design change refer and, and the revenue, and the uh, revenue was uh, included actually what was uh, specified uh, in the uh, quantity takeoff. So there was kind of no need to um, to make a special one uh, for that. And then there's been uh, also a change in um, uh, from the technical side of how to handle MBDs uh, uh, and. Um, if cover go beyond what is uh, in, in this uh, project, but uh, there has been some changes, and the uh, introduction of IDS uh, made it uh, kind of more relevant to, to make an IDS uh, than MBD because it's already uh, included. Uh, then there could be some issues uh, about software that are not able to, to handle everything in the revenue, but I think that's a, a different uh, matter. Um, so, um, uh, the the, uh, the challenge uh, with quantities is that uh, being smart has uh, some base quantities and uh, uh, that's nice but that could also be neat for something else and I remember I talked with with Jan from Sweden and, and other people kind of that uh, there are different needs and uh, for quantities for cost or for uh, environmental aspects or different aspects uh, so that could be uh, what what should be uh, included. And uh, just for a wall, there could be a kind of uh, which areas, uh, what do we need, uh, which length, and so forth. Uh, in Denmark, we have a rule that uh, if a window is uh, smaller than uh, half a square meter, you shouldn't uh, subtract it from, from the volume. So it's, uh, it's nice to have the base quantities, but it wants not so low problem. And then um, that was uh, the idea, and uh, we will... Um, uh, use the uh, existing uh, way of transferring the, the quantities if it's outside IOC. So you could imagine that you could use the base quantities. Uh, and uh, I have always made some, some comments. The base quantities are, are nice, but be aware that uh, uh, it's not mandatory always to make base quantities. If you have complicated geometry, uh, some other stuff uh, is actually allowed to leave it out. And uh, that could be a challenge uh, if you believe that you get the quantities uh, of a building and then it's, uh, some percentage is actually not, depending on the geometry of the building, is, has been the, is not included. And um, it's been decided that there should be some, uh, some more guidance. Uh, so you could imagine that you have uh, add a custom uh, a quantity set uh, that is uh, dedicated to, to the area. And, uh, of course, we can't uh, do all the um, rules for quantities in, in the world, but uh, at least we could uh, give it a, a, uh, specify how it should be, um, be implemented. Uh, so you have the uh, base quantities, uh, and that could be um, the height of a column. Uh, but uh, in Denmark, because we know other uh, countries, uh, that 
if it's a, a prefab column, you should actually only have the height of the wall without joints. Uh, so that's uh, kind of how you do it. And that endless number of, of different rules. Uh, so the basic idea was to, uh, to have the base quantities and then have other quantities. Um, and that could be, uh, if we look at a, uh, a column, again, according to Danish rule, but it's not to promote Danish rule, but just to specify that it can be different just for the links, kind of how you define it. Uh, and um, that could be um, then put into to all the quantities and also a reference where it's, uh, uh, you can find further the documentation. So the idea was that you could use the existing uh, structure in IC4, and now it's part of the MBD, uh, so that should be, be fine. Uh, and that has been developed, and it's also been made uh, IDM according to, to that. Then um, um, there's not hasn't been too much certified software according to the, to the reference you are design transfer view. Uh, I use uh, construct. I think it's called uh, at some point, and that uh, was able to, uh, uh, to display the uh, base quantities, uh, but also it's it possible to make uh, uh, custom uh, quantities. So if you had want to have it, it's not, it's not done by kind of magic. So if you want to have German rules for, for how to do measurement, you have to have an application that are able to do that, but that's here is where you should, should store it. Um, but um, there's been a, um, a change, kind of as I said, kind of it's already included in the uh, in the uh, in the reference view. Uh, so using existing structures, uh, but I'm not still sure. Um, also from uh, uh, Leon. It has to be verified, kind of, if the software is able to handle custom properties, uh, quantities. So the uh, first version of, of the uh, IDS is covering the base quantities. Uh, it's just a simple test here uh, with, uh, from, from uh, Revit, to my knowledge, with the current uh, or the most updated, uh, I don't know, a month ago. Um, um, provide the IC file uh, I, I exported from Revit. And then I have used uh, the open IC viewer and, um, and ACA software to, to, to verify it. And there's still some um, uh, differences. So here is the, uh, uh, is the uh, IDS. Uh, and that was uh, based on a version that uh, Leon and uh, Ruben made from, from Netherlands. Uh, and um, yeah, it's, it's uh, an XML file following the IDS uh, principles. Uh, and for a wall, for instance, you have to specify, you can specify uh, the uh, different uh, uh, links and widths and, and so forth. Then I, uh, and there are something like more, or less, almost 10 uh, for, for a wall. Then um, I tried uh, to, to test it in some software. Uh, and um, and in the open IC viewer, uh, uh, it's uh, here. It's kind of it's identify all the uh, uh, base quantities that should be uh, verified. Uh, and then uh, I got the uh, the feedback from the system that it was okay because the quantity sets existed for uh, a wall and uh, and they were uh, okay. Um, but I'm a little bit in doubt. This is uh, from um, uh, Akasoft, the US BIM. Uh, there I um, got a, a more uh, thorough into investigation. So I got the uh, something, there's something to do with the screen here, but uh, I got kind of, well, the site doesn't actually have uh, any values. Uh, so it's, uh, it ex it's, 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 there's some parameters missing. Uh, and you can argue whether you would put it into the model uh, or not uh, if you just have a wall. Uh, but 
uh, these are the quantities uh, missing for the site building uh, and building story and um, for uh, um, a wall you have some quantities but some are missing and I have uh, have a dialogue with Leon uh, whether the certified software is okay or not and I think we'll investigate that a, uh, a little further kind of uh, because uh, to my knowledge these parameters should be in the um, in the file uh, so uh, um, but by using IDS uh, you can post uh, kind of uh, verify what's uh, in the actual file but also kind of the software is generated generating the, the appropriate uh, uh, quantities then uh, I still have to um, uh, find out kind of uh, there are very limited capabilities to make quant uh, quantity sets and there's also some doubt whether they can be checked uh, I would like if you have custom property set, uh, custom, yeah, <laughs> custom quantity set, that you can, that the software at least allow you to specify what it represents. Is this quantity according to Italian uh, uh, practice or Danish practice or Japanese uh, practice, whatever, um, and that could be put into the uh, uh, to the script or, or the formula, and there's some. Uh, 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 doubt whether that can be done in the um, existing uh, IDS format and that has to be uh, verified and also to get some uh, consistent uh, results from I uh, IDS checkers and uh, as more coming uh, it will be possible to uh, to test it according to to, um, to see if there's a, a consistency if it comes to the same result but the Conclusion is that kind of it's been changed into IDS because the MBD already is uh, what was in the MBD was more or less included in the revenue for base quantities that are made an IDS and for custom uh, quantity sets uh, there's still uh, some work to, to be done. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Um, any questions for Jan from Yep, we have a question from Martha. Okay. Hello, uh, nice presentation. Uh, um, one of my pains uh, as an architect was to, at the end of the technical design, see how I, how I can easily and rapidly extract the specifications and the <clears throat> quantity takeoff and uh, cost estimate. And um, I, had, I, made, I, had, I made some work on it. Uh, I would like to share with you. Uh, it's not IFC based, but I would like to lift it to IFC. Um, and uh, the thing I've done is that I created um, an add-in that uh, leads, uh, deals with uh, uh, existing categories and uh, uh, made and also parameters made by, by us uh, and this add-in was was written in python and then i use uh, the add-in to link uh, information from a database and then it extracts the the specifications in excel uh, and also the the cost estimate one thing that i would like to ask is one of the things I struggle uh, as an architect and pro project coordinator is when I deliver these specifications to tender, uh, the construction companies uh, receive, have uh, received these documents with uh, several ways of rearrangement, like the work breakdown structure. And uh, I feel that uh, maybe Building Smart may have a, a role to play I've checked out, uh, in, uh, like in UK, the uh, RICS, for example, as a proposal on more granular uh, breakdown structure for uh, tendering and uh, less granular one when we are making estimates in the earlier phase of project. 
and it's it's a pain. And I talked with a, a lot of uh, construction companies that receive uh, from different different project uh, teams uh, to tender, and they are organized in completely different ways. And I think that managing this information is also part of uh, building information modeling. Uh, what do you think about that? Did you think about that when you were um, making yeah, this strategy? About the... Uh, the uh of the rules of, of measurement I, I uh, the, the, the base quantities are, are made by building smart as and as as i said something has been um, uh, it's not mandatory for complex elements to do thing uh, to include it and uh, it might be uh, natural from a i don't know software perspective but it's it's of course it's necessary to, to have quantities of what you have modeled uh, so uh, um, so that kind of is, uh, is is an aspect, but also I think it will be very difficult for Bini Smart to explain how you should change the industry in um, in uh, doing the quantities. The kind of the quantities are. I'm not talking no, about. No, no, yeah, oh, okay. uh, but kind of, and that's was why um, I think IC should be maybe able to uh, to include uh, local needs. Uh, but the kind of view from uh, Leon is that business mass should not do something which is not um, can it be uh, applied internationally. Mm -hmm. uh, then there could be something be done in chapters. Uh, but this, um, let's talk about kind of kind of what, what could be appeared because the, the uh, a part of this is also the building materials, and then that's not really a part of of. Uh, of, of this MBD and also not part of, of the reference mm -hmm. view. Uh, so there's definitely a, a need for uh, a structure, but the structure has to be uh, internationally accepted. Yes, and, and, and that, it's hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, maybe by chapter that yeah, can yeah, be... Yeah, but okay. then it would not go into international that, but then it could be a, a chapter um, yes. initiative. Yeah. Okay, we have to keep up with the time. Thank you. I give no other questions. I think uh, if you have a questions, we can keep it for the latest uh, Q&A we have at the very end. It will maybe better to keep now. So I, uh, I will announce the next uh, speaker. Now we have a working group. Uh, I have the spatial zone. Yoshinobu Adachi, David, and uh, Gianluca. David Delgado and uh, Gianluca Genoa, please uh, join us on the stage. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Yoshino Badachi, and uh, I will start from my David? presentations. It's okay. And David and Sergey will be last. Okay. So this is the uh, a part of a uh, final uh, it's the, uh, stage of our technical report for IFG spatial zone requirements and implementations. The, actually, this is the first time <laughs> that the, uh, the core members are meeting face to face due to the uh, COVID. But th this is very, very final, finalizing stage. So I'm very happy to do that. Okay, so uh, it, it, this is our uh, part of the uh, agenda. So I, 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 I'm going to uh, touch with you a little bit about uh, project overview uh, of IFG Special Zone. Uh, left hand side, left top, uh, is showing that the, uh, uh, in 2018, uh, this project was initially proposed in Tokyo Summit 2018. And we had uh, a couple of years for warming up uh, Beijing uh, summit or some other uh, summits. And fi finally, we officially started a uh, special zone uh, project 2020. And since then, uh, John Luker has been uh, leading this project. And these uh, red lines are uh, recent uh, timelines. The last year, we had a very hard work for uh, finalizing our uh, questionnaires and uh, some uh, consultations 
and, and writing uh, its final report. We had a, a couple of uh, consultations and suggestions from steering committees. And we, we had a, a, a couple of questionnaire with uh, software vendors and the power users in the middle of uh, 2022. And we summarized such kind of the uh, user needs and the software vendor uh, supporting uh, situations in our uh, final uh, report. And we have submitted already. And now it's very finalizing staging. And uh, this loan uh, summit is quite a good opportunity to present uh, the, uh, the overview of our outcomes. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to show a very fundamental uh, information about the special zone is IFG schema. And, and uh, after me, so David will touch with much more uh, uh, detail of use cases. So special element is very fundamental design intent and the special structure. And it's very old and historical classes from uh, IFC 1.5. And the special zone is also very, very close domain information to represent area or volume. So we need a, a very sp specific process or uh, information exchange uh, definitions. Otherwise, we, we can communicate each other uh, by uh, the communicating the uh, uh, spatial zone information. In IFC 4, uh, we had a, a new entity named IFC spatial uh, zone. The in, so we, we have a, a, it's a very, it, it, it's, it's a two kind of uh, spatial element in IFC 4. The first one is the IFC space, as you know. Uh, IFC space is a hierarchical spatial structure element. And, and we have been using IFC space to communicate already. But we didn't know the, uh, the detail of use cases. And uh, no software vendor implemented the spatial zone important exposed. So th that was the, uh, the motivation of this uh, project. So this is the uh, summarize of uh, what is actually space, spatial zone and zone. It's very similar uh, terminology, but uh, each, each class has each meaning. So IFC space, as you know, it is very uh, physically and logically partitioned area of volume. It's a wall. And and the floor and the ceiling. And this is very specific meaning for architectural design. And the zone, IFC space, space uh, IFC zone is a, a different kind of uh, class. Uh, the zone is a, uh, a kind of IFC group. So uh, IFC zone is not uh, presenting uh, its kind of uh, well, physical area and zone. It, it is zone is kind of a collection of a special element. And IFC special zone is a kind of a, a special element. And, and uh, it is an area with a specific role. And this is a new entity of IFC space. And the special zone is very flexible, uh, multiple domain use. So uh, if you look at the IFC for uh, special zone definitions, a spatial zone might be used to re represent a thermal zone, construction zone, a lighting zone, or this kind of very much purpose uh, use for uh, space information. And uh, this is the IFC for addendum two uh, spatial zone type enumerations. And there are a uh, few. Uh, is uh, defined the types like construction, fire safety, lighting, occupancy, security, or something like that. So th this is the uh, official IFC4 uh, schema is a defining uh, enumeration type. And we, if we look at the uh, latest IFC 4.3 schema, uh, 
uh, special zone enumeration are, are expanded, and new uh, enumeration like interference and reservations are added into schema. So in, in this uh, special zone project, uh, we carefully uh, analyze the existing schema and, and we uh, discussed about the, uh, the fundamental uh, special zone use case cluster from existing uh, enumerations. And we talked about the uh, how uh, users can ex extend uh, special zone enumeration type for each regional or uh, local uh, special zone uh, use cases. So uh, next, uh, so David will talk about uh, detail of special zone use case cluster, how uh, the, the special zones are uh, categorized in the fundamental enumeration. Thanks, Yoshi. Uh, oh, yeah, thank you. So, um, the idea, is, as Yoshi um, has introduced, is to, um, so our proposal is to uh, let, uh, to group uh, in different um, clusters. We, we, we call them clusters uh, to group these uh, different use cases. Um, and then uh, the idea is to have um, uh, in, in the type enumeration, um, uh, this list of uh, clusters there. Uh, it's uh, as a high level way of um, identify uh, um, the different, uh, each, each of these use cases, right? So uh, these are the five um, use cases that we have uh, identified here. Um, when it's coordination and reservation, definition and declaration, uh, regulation and validation, message information, you will see that this is uh, for communication purposes, and uh, boundary for analysis and computation. Um, the first one, coordination and reservation, as you can see here, there's also uh, more detail. Um, uh, the idea is to cover uh, many different um, uh, needs that we have across different domains, because this is not just also for, uh, of course, building, it's uh, for any other uh, domain for the infrastructure or whatever. But uh, in this case, it's uh, all those uh, clearances or spaces that we need <clears throat> when we are um, uh, defining our uh, objects, such as uh, affected areas, uh, um, spaces for management uh, from a logistic point of view. Um, and as you can see here, the, the last one, and this is uh, an attribute that we are adding in each of, of, of those um, use cases, the, uh, it could be temporary or permanent. Okay. Another one, it's the definition and declaration. As you can see here, this is quite, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a wide um, a spectrum. Uh, from a urban um, uh, point of view, there's a lot of different uh, use, uh, uses, such as, um, so somehow could be a way to connect um, the urban uh, domain um, uh, with the uh, built asset one, you know? So, uh, sorry, it's, yeah, exactly. So, uh, city level of zoning, uh, functional area uh, separation. Once you are inside this building, for example, here we have an IFC space, but probably we want to distinguish the, um, uh, the three uh, meter um, uh, zone that it's attached to the uh, facade because, I don't know, we have different uh, scenarios in terms of lighting or here we are <coughs> on the stage and or we have some kind of emergency um, uh, sub 
zone, let's say. So as um, uh, Yoshi mentioned, uh, I, um, one of the advantages of this uh, class is that it's uh, non-hierarchical uh, in terms of the um, uh, schema structure, a special structure, which uh, um, um, enables us to be more, let's say, flexible in terms of um, uh, how we manage our spaces here. Uh, no matter if we are inside the building or outside or even uh, in between. Um, as you can see here, it could be also uh, very useful for landscape design. Uh, and of course, this is a, one, a, a, a domain with a lot of uh, opportunities. And uh, the character of this um, uh, use case um, is uh, to be permanent because it's a declaration and definition. Then another one, it's for regulation and validation purposes, um, such as building codes, uh, restrictions, uh, city planning regulations. Um, and um, so, in other words, is about um, uh, giving a, um, a shape representation to everything that, of course, <laughs> We cannot see, but it's not uh, the space itself. It's uh, something um, that we need a shape representation for that, such as the uh, restrictions in terms of volumes that we cannot um, go across them, but it's uh, some kind of constraint for us. Um, so um, there's a need to uh, create a geometry, a shape representation on those objects. So um, the special zone uh, cover that and also, of course, uh, can um, include uh, the different um, uh, uh, property sets that will um, uh, give the detail to all those uh, shapes. Um, then there is another use case, uh, which is using uh, these geometries that are non-hierarchical to, so let's say, as a mean or a vehicle to um, communicate um, the issues, you know. So this is another another interesting um, um, uh, case in which, uh, if you have the need to, uh, let's say, have a physical, although it's digital, um, uh, way of represent the issue within the uh, space, you can use also this. So it's not about. Uh, um, um, the uh, real uh, representation uh, of that. It's about having that uh, geometry existing uh, within the model, you know, and then you can, uh, of course, connect it using the uh, BCF uh, standard uh, connected to that geometry. So this is a quite uh, interesting uh, case as well. And um, the, the, the last but not the least is also for uh, boundary uh, for analysis and computation, so in other words, for uh, simulation. And of course, there's all uh, this list as, for example, area measurement, energy simulation, multi-agent simulation, evocation. So there's a huge list, even more than here, uh, than you can see here, uh, to, to cover also uh, with this. So as you can see here, it's full of different uh, use cases. Uh, um, all of them um, are needs, real needs from the from the sector. What we need here, as Mirbeck, I don't know if uh, he's uh, here. <laughs> what what we really need, and that's why uh, we are working on this project. It's uh, software vendor implementation. Otherwise, if you go now and you want to export and to create an FC uh, spatial zone, unless you are a magician like Sergey, uh, you know, uh, as you will see right now, uh, it's quite uh, difficult, right? So this is the idea. So Sergey, please. Thank you very much, David. Uh, it's, um, it's really an honor because I'm very late to the party. I'm, I'm actually super late to the party. Uh, everything was done pretty much when I came in uh, and I have the, the um, the pleasure and also the uh, privilege to show uh, a part of the report and how we imagine to actually implement uh, this in IFC. Um, 
I will structure it in, in two different uh, uh, levels here. First of all, we have some recommendations that I will go through. We sort of try to link them back to the documentation and to the, to, to the standard that we want to use. Sergey, so, okay. we just need to share that through the Hopin platform. Okay, yeah. so in this chapter, uh, what I was saying is we took a bunch of uh, templates in, in order to, um, to facilitate our requirements. We linked them back to the documentation and, it, and based on these templates, um, we put out a couple of um, recommendations how to do it with IFC 4. I mean, it's also applicable to 4.3, so that's not, not the big problem. But uh, the usages that are derived from these templates are already available in IFC 4 and IFC 2x3 even. So you can do the same thing or, or almost the same thing in IFC 2x3 also. Uh, a, a bunch of tweaks here and there, but uh, it should work uh, very similar to this. Uh, and the rec recommendations that we have here um, are based on, on four templates. So one is the predefined type template, uh, which basically just takes the official predefined types of IFC uh, entities, like IFC wall, for example, has a solid uh, predefined type, solid wall predefined type. Um, and we can type the spatial zone in the same manner because it also has a predefined type. If we don't find the predefined type inside uh, the official specification, we can still do a user-defined uh, setting and then uh, use that for, uh, for, for our files. So this is the extension mechanism where we, we just recommend in, in specifying the spatial zone if you want to type it. Then another um, possibility is, of course, using 4.3 because it already covers a couple a couple of uh, uh, these predefined types that we um, that we proposed or that we wanted to use. Um, and the the other template that we would sort of recommend if the software does not support a predefined type is is property sets for objects, where we we would suggest putting our values or our, our typing into PSET spatial zone common uh, into the reference property. Um, and this one is all, also has its own template assigned. Uh, it's the property sets for override. The link is in the report. So if, you're, if, you, if you read the report, you will have all of these recommendations there. And it's also supposed to be uh, sort of um, at some point generated for the software vendors uh, in, in, in a proper implementable standard. Um, the third one that we were looking at is classification. So let's say you have a local classification somewhere in, in, your, um, in your country and you just want to use the typings from, from there. You pretty much just use the IFC classification template. Um, now I'm not going to go through all of these templates, but maybe this one is quite interesting um, because it's, uh, it's one that I have seen misused a lot. Um, let me zoom in here. And what it basically does is it takes a generic IFC object, like IFC object. So for example, again, spatial zone instead of the object over here, and it assigns a classification reference. So your local classification reference with, a identifica with an ident identification. I'm too far, I guess, uh, turned off on me, um, with an identification and a name uh, with all of the reference tokens. So how exactly the, the identification of this classification is separated. Um, I usually bring up the DIN uh, 276, which is dot separated. So you have 300 and uh, 300 dot 330 dot 334 for uh, for for I think that's uh, an internal fire rated wall um, and the dots are then encoded in, in reference tokens so the receiving software actually knows how to parse the identification um, this can also be assigned to type objects the same way as it is 
to, to objects, so spatial zone or spatial zone type, both the same. Uh, and uh, by referencing it back to the classification, you also have the, the references back to, to the URI where this classification is stored and so on. So you get the, the, entire, um, the entire set of information that you would like into this, uh, uh, into this one concept template. And the, the, the last one would be object typing, which is pretty much just use IFC spatial zone and give the, the, the IFC, IFC spatial zone type the name that we want. And all of this is uh, in a manner specified here is, is not yet completely implementable. So that's where MVD sort of comes in because it allows documentation uh, of, of such things or such usages. Um, and let me just show you how to actually then uh, uh, maybe work with this data uh, prototype application. So bear with me. Um, and in principle, you could you could then once this is document documented as a proper MVD where where you have the the uh, the implementable as well computer and human readable setting, um, you you can then pretty much just go and um, and uh, write your rules in there. And let me just show you um, this setup. For example, uh, let's let's go for let's go for a spatial zone project. So we want to verify the schema. Also, we let's let's do it. Let's do a construction zone, I guess. We also have some example files, so uh, that makes it easier. Uh, let's say spatial zone construction. And we apply this to spatial zones. We say that, you know, uh, uh, the name should be a spatial zone. Now, why, why do I have this particular name? <laughs> because I know it's in the file so uh, that we have one positive test and one negative, but I do know that we don't have a construction predefined type. So let's do this uh, and check our file here. And uh, you pretty much get the results. So we check the spatial zone construction, uh, the name I've given it, the attribute name should be spatial zone. <coughs> So that's uh, that, that's uh, the first part of the of the test, and the spatial zone should have construction predefined type on it, and of course it fails because we don't have that. Um, so let me show you the the file, the file content here. What what's actually in the spatial zone? Uh, let's go for this editor. So I, uh, which which one was I testing? I was testing. Uh, what, this GUID, okay, this is not the best GUID, but this one should be okay. So let's search for this one. Okay, so we, ha we have our spatial zone, as you see the name obviously passes because I copied it from the file directly, but it doesn't have a predefined type. So uh, this is the, the, the attribute where the predefined type should be. So if we put in the predefined type here, the, the checker will also uh, notify that. And this is sort of where, where we kind of, you know, also can, can do the following. We can, we can uh, create another check. Let me actually use my mouse here. Let's create another check just to show you how this works. Um, in order to write these these rules, we just we just rely on on certain language based uh, concepts where we say where, where you can say different things about an object. So um, let's let's maybe just um, go for uh, something like uh, first of all, I'm going to limit my IFC stuff here, and I'm going to say I'm only checking spatial zone. Obviously, we're in a spatial zone project. Um, so each spatial zone, uh, of course, I can give 
different names to 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 my checks, but uh, just to show you approximately how the 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 writing or or let's say the creation of a specification might work because from this we can generate as well an MVD and its documentation or IDS or check or or we can even uh, uh, generate other other uh, rule based languages from it. Um, and uh, if if for the spatial zone project where we have very explicit requirements, we want to uh, let's say you know just go for an object type check. So we had, we had object typing also in the in the recommendations. We could do the same thing here for object type, where we would just put in a, a string that we want to check. Uh, it it also always let's let's maybe show this if if I have a block, uh, this is a yes no, so a typical boolean. I cannot attach it, so it, it does give you some guidance that you don't have to. Um, don't have to know all of the <laughs> schema uh, related uh, typing and and so on but in principle it relies on on these these blocks that can be modified and we, we just you know write sentences pretty much in 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 here uh, uh so, so let's say i i use the classification where i say that is classified as because i was explaining the classification before i would just say you know it's classified as um construction so that's another option of how how you would encode this either you have a predefined type or or we could even say something like something really stupid like you know let's let's actually delete this one and and say okay i just want to have construction in my name so why not you know uh, in the end and uh if i then modify the file here and just say I'm over. I'm sorry. In that case, please uh, let's uh, let's just talk about it afterwards. In, you, the the principle should be should be uh, should be clear by now. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And uh, handing it over. So, yes. So. Thank you again to the experts on IFC Special Zone team. So I'm glad uh, that we finally submitted the report. So uh, also from my side, I thank you all the team for working together two years and our experts to presenting it today. Also to you, you had the opportunity to download the technical report soon. So we'd we'll be happy if you can also give our feedbacks. And if you are a software vendor, please uh, approach to us. Uh, we would be happy to drive the way to, or path the way to implement uh, the ISP spatial zone usage in the ongoing beam authoring tools. So thank you for that. So before closing the session, I would like to give the opportunity to maybe ask one or two questions if there's any in hop-in. So here we see it. So if you have any questions, uh, please write it there. So we have here the expert to answer. If there's any question from the rest of the session, also from the fire uh, safety, steel construction or quantity takeoff also just you have this less chance to ask they're all here the presenters yep um thanks Gianluca um and Sergey and David and, and Yoshi uh, as Gianluca just said any questions from the room or for the spatial zone team this is the opportunity Jan's going to go yeah through. we have a question from Jan yeah I I've, I've yeah, thank you for, for, for the presentation. I was, I, I, of course, I could look into the documentation of a schema and, and, and also your report, but uh, spatial zones, can they be, uh, do they have to be um, in the file where the kind of the other objects are, the other entities, or could it be, uh, you, I assume that you could have, the architect could make an IC model and then the structure engineer could make a, a model and then you just use them as reference, but, but you would like to have a, uh, some zones for, as a, as a contractor. Uh, so kind of how do, are you able to, um, to do that or do you need to have all the entities in to, to make a relationship uh, to uh, those other entities uh, it, it, yeah. can it can make sense to do it in simple files or do you need to be on a, a yeah server of some sort of some sort that can connect everything so again would you 
so a very technical question. Thanks for that. That makes me happy always. <laughs> uh, the typical way of attaching spatial zone in IFC 4 that's documented in IFC 4 and IFC uh, 4x3 is that you have them as part of the spatial structure hierarchy, but not a strict spatial structure hierarchy. They can be contained and aggregated. So that that's that that's the ways that we would do it, and meaning, in the end, uh, since spatial zones do carry their own geometry, it would be possible to have a, a file completely with spatial zones. So you wouldn't you wouldn't even have to go for anything other than spatial zones. Yes, very simple files. Any other questions? There is one. <clears throat> Um, do the second order space boundaries have any place in the spatial zones? I can just take some examples. I don't think so. Because it's applied for IFC spaces, not for IFC spaces. Okay. Okay. So spatial zones do have their, their own geometry, but they don't. Uh, feature a concept for for spatial boundaries. Um, the, the the spatial boundaries are sort of a weird entity in, in that they are actually relationships. So uh, it's it's a bit of a interesting point, but uh, it is possible to attach spatial boundaries. Uh, I mean, real space real space boundaries to spatial zones. So that that's a possibility. It's just not recorded in the in the specification yet. We could also look into that, but the requirements were not uh, formulated in in that way. Yeah, that's a question. Yes, hello. Um, if I understand well, these spatial zones spatial spatial zones are c communicated through EFC. And for example, uh, imagining that we are uh, submitting a project for approval in a city council, and we as architects have to communicate the horizontal property. That should be a spatial zone, yes? Yes, yes, yes. With information in it. Yeah. Like uh, this is common area, this is apartment A, B, C with these characteristics. Yeah. So That's the what... city council can analyze the IFC that it's rendered and and, and analyze um, the proper pro, uh, horizontal property application that we propose to to be submitted and accepted. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is a perfect use case of that. Okay. And, and, unless uh, you have a so, in other words, uh, the, if you have the need of a shape representation. Yes. Because not always uh, could be, but because you you all could also use the. IFC spaces, uh, the ones that are defining this room and so on, and then group them, but as a system. And then you have another class, which is IFC zone, which is another stuff. Uh, uh, if you have uh, that need about uh, mm -hmm. representing a geometry, grouping other even, because you, you can have a spatial zone um, that is also, um, has also sub spatial zones as well, uh, you know, yeah, so. Because it has, it has a volume, an apartment has a volume. Yeah, yeah. Uh, nowadays, I use area plans to communicate uh, this information. And I use schedules to uh, convey the information that are inside the area plans. I don't know if IFC uh, already transports this information to be analyzed for the city council, or if we need to create a spatial zone to communicate this information, so it goes to IFC. Do you understand what I'm saying? I think it's a communication, a communication port. Yeah. I think I know what you mean. Uh, you probably don't need, it. it's a generic enough entity that you can use it for, for uh, buildings or even infrastructure. We, we have infrastructure cases, so uh, you know, even even the uh, uh, the infra room projects uh, relied on on spatial zones, so it's not necessary to have a, an additional spatial zone for for every use case. It can be classified. Uh, it can be it can have generic properties, and you can specify it in order to filter uh, these special zone special spatial zones 
in your data sets with these kinds of concepts. Uh, and that, that, that's what we were trying to achieve with, with, the, uh, with the documentation uh, and the report where you have usages specified how, how you can generalize your, your, your data for that. Uh, and one, one additional remark uh, I would like to uh, put forward that um, uh, I think is, is really uh, uh, important to know is that if we are dealing with uh, wall-bounded spaces, those are typically IFC space, like David, David said. Not, if, if it's not wall-bounded, then spatial zones are the way to go, yes. I, I have a remark. Uh, I have a remark. We have, uh, I have seen the projects in Germany, and it's currently even uh, as um, supported as a um, permit uh, for uh, building permitting. They were using uh, outside uh, spaces for parking, parking lots, like park lot number two, one, three, as uh, they number it. So you know that they used, uh, of course, that was a, I guess that was a main limitation because this IFC spatial zone was not supported with the current, uh, let's say, software um, solutions. That's why they had to use IFC uh, spaces for that purpose. You, are, you you can use and of course you have your volume because uh, in most of the cases, especially for garage under under um, passages, you have uh, height limits for like most of the time two two meters, so that you will not be able to drive in with your SUV if you have a big one. So you have to uh, have a volume for that. And of course, I what we have seen. Remember the example that John Luca uh, showed us. Uh, Spatial zone could be used also for for traffic routes. I mean, for, especially for traffic routes, because they you have uh, traffic limits for um, vehicles, right? You have uh, four meters, whatever, and you ha you can regulate that as a point. And with a new introduction of IFC 4.3, there is a, exactly two now two types, like uh, external and the internal uh, spatial zone. So. That's, I think it will be really interesting. But you have an alternative to currently use IFC space, but I don't. So I Thank guess you. we need. Yeah. No, no, just one comment for this. Uh, it's our project is about to submit the, our uh, the contents to UCM, Use Case Management Database. So I think the UCM might be good press to share the new ideas of how to utilize uh, specific uh, well, use cases. So pr please welcome to <laughs> UCM, U Use Case Management. Come in, come and see, come and see the spatial zone uh, team, Martha. They'll um, they'll pass their details to you. I'm sure. We direct to correct the uh, many voices or inputs. Uh, uh, yeah, UCM. I'm going to bring the session to an end. Um, thank you for the question, Martha, and to everyone else for the questions and for attending the building room session two today. Thanks to the Spatial Zone team for their excellent presentation, as always. Uh, good to see the progress that the project is, has made. Um, and thank you to everybody else, uh, Jan, Merbeck, Luke, Asim, and Pete, who have presented today. Uh, lunch is available if you can work your way along the corridor, or down the stairs, and back to ground level. Uh, good luck. Um, we'll, we'll be in this room again in 50 minutes' time at half past one with infrastructure room. Um, and then again at 3.30 with the final building room session. Thank you.